Hello, and welcome to the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios of the National Press Foundation in Washington, D.C. My name is Rachel Jones, and I am the Director of Journalism Initiatives with NPF. Today, we're launching the first virtual training of the 2024 Widening the Pipeline Fellowship for Early Career Journalists of Color. But before we get started, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors, the Evelyn Y. Davis Foundation and Lenovo. In this turbulent era for American media, there's a persistent thread that's hard to ignore. A 2023 study released by the National Association of Hispanic Journalists unpacked an ongoing lack of diversity for the vast majority of investigative news teams in America. Of nearly 180 reporters identified by the study, 60% were white. Only about two dozen were Latino, 15 were Black, 19 were Asian or Pacific Asian, and just two were Indigenous. So how are journalists of color confronting this reality? And what strategies are they using to give voice to communities that have been historically ignored or neglected? Well, our conversations today will explore that topic, beginning with our very first speaker, Damaso Reyes is the executive editor and the investigation editors, editor for the New York Amsterdam News, one of the nation's oldest Black weekly newspapers. He has been a journalist and contributor to the Amsterdam News since 1996, and he's also been published by the AP, the New York Times, San Francisco Chronicle, the Irish Times, a whole list of, of outlets. Previous assignments that he's had have taken him to Rwanda, Tanzania, and throughout the United States and Europe. His images were also featured in the monograph, Black, a Celebration of the Culture, and the book, Innocence Lost, When Child Soldiers Go to War. You can read Damaso's full bio on our website at nationalpress.org. Damaso, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it is my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Before I let you jump into the presentation that you have prepared for us, I wanted to revisit uh, our conversation, our prep conversation, in which I shared with you that when I entered a newsroom 40 years ago, almost 40 years ago, the investigative reporter was this guy, older seasoned reporter, primarily a white male, who kind of had his corner of the newsroom staked out. And you didn't know what he was doing or where he was most of the time. But then a year or so later, a big story gets published and it gets a lot of, hmm. of uh, hoo-ha, and then he disappears again. So tell us how that sort of image has kind of haunted investigative re uh, reporting through the years and why that has to change. Yeah, well, I'm going to talk about a little bit about that in my presentation, but um, investigative units historically have been seen as the elite of the elite, the special forces of journalism, so to speak. And we know that um, our newsrooms, you know, since, you know, since well before the Kerner Commission report came out, but that particular report elucidated how segregated our newsrooms were and how unreflective our newsrooms were. Uh, were and to a large extent still are from both our nation in general, but also the specific communities in which those newsrooms are based. And so if we know that newsrooms are not as diverse as they need to be, then investigative units are only going to be that much less diverse because they are considered the elite of the elite. So who gets those opportunities, who gets the fellowships, who gets the training, who gets the recruitment into those units? Um, it, it generally, it, it's going to be people from the newsrooms themselves, and the newsrooms are not as diverse as they need to be. So if we are going to have uh, newsrooms and news organizations that matter, they need to reflect the communities that they're based in and they're supposed to represent. And the only way to do that is to recruit, train, give opportunities to more journalists of color, which is exactly why uh, we created our investigative unit. Well, look, that's a good uh, point for you to just take it away and walk us through your presentation. All right, I will do that. I'm going to share a link to uh, our investigative units 
page on our website in the chat, so you can go ahead and take a look at that. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So I'm going to talk for a little while, uh, maybe about 15 or 20 minutes. And then I really want to open it up to, to discussion and conversation because I feel like the, the questions that you all have are going to be a lot more interesting than, than probably anything that I come up with or I can talk about. So, um, all right, I'm going to take it away. Um, you can find us on Twitter. I refuse to call it X, but uh, you can find us uh, on social media and, of course, at uh, the link that I shared in the chat. Uh, and I'll also uh, later on drop my uh, email address if anybody's interested in emailing me. Um, a little bit about me. Um, so I was born and raised in, in New York. Uh, I've been a journalist since 1996. I actually started my career at the Amsterdam News uh, while I was still in high school. I started as a freelancer. Um, a lot of my work is taking me abroad. Uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, living in and working overseas um, as a journalist. Uh, I'm a living kidney donor, and I once ran a marathon, and I still think that was a pretty bad idea, but I finished. So let's get a move on. So um, one of the first places I went overseas was uh, Rwanda, and I have a background in photography as well as in uh, text-based journalism. And I did this uh, this particular series I did in 2004 for the Amsterdam News. Uh, the first time I went to Rwanda was in 1999. So it was actually probably younger than a lot of you uh, who are on this call. I was still uh, I was still in college at the time. You were in Rwanda what years? Uh, I was first there in 1999 and then in, uh, in 2004. Um, and... As I as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the work that I've done has has been international. Yeah. So you know, I've I've been to Africa. I've spent a lot of time in Europe. And for me, you know, my work, the work of my life has really been trying to focus on marginalized and underrepresented voices. That's the heart of of, of what I do and, and what I'm interested in. Uh, next slide. So. What does investigative journalism look like? Let's find out. Next slide. Uh, this is the uh, myth, right? This is, sorry, there's a incoming call here. Apologies, I'm at somebody else's apartment. Um, this is sort of the myth. Uh, you know, older white guys with gray hair, uh, standing around a desk in a corner of the newsroom, as as was uh, mentioned. Can we go to the next slide? And, you know, Pointer did an article talking about what we lose when newsrooms close, and they use a picture of the New York Times newsroom from 1978, the year I was born. Uh, and as far as I can see in this picture, there aren't any people of color. In fact, there's a white guy on the left side with a cigar in his mouth, if you can try to be more stereotypical. Uh, next slide. And yeah, thank you. And, you know, this is the, the, the uh, an article about the study uh, that was referenced at the top of, um, of our conversation. And investigative units are not very diverse. And investigative editors are... Uh, not very diverse. So if the editors aren't diverse, you can imagine what happens to the people uh, working under them. So this is the atmosphere uh, in which I helped to found uh, the investigative unit at the Amsterdam News. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, the Blacklight, and the link is is has been shared in the chat. Um, a little before we were founded, uh, Futuro Media, which produces Latino USA, among other things, the Pulitzer Prize winning news organization founded by Maria Hinojosa, started their investigative unit. Um, so for me, the, the one of the main motivators behind founding Blacklight is this idea that 
we should have this capacity within our newsroom, within a newsroom of color, <clears throat> rather than having to depend upon uh, places like ProPublica and the New York Times to do stories about us, usually by journalists who are not from our communities. I wanted to create um, a resource within our community to do stories about our community. Uh, next slide. And unfortunately, this is a PDF, so you can't, uh, we can't, this is just a, um, a trailer for, we produced our first documentary film uh, last year. And <clears throat> to be able to have that capacity to produce a documentary short film about, in this case, a violence interrupter working in Harlem uh, to reduce gun violence in his community after being a perpetrator of gun violence in his community is a really powerful thing. This is something we might associate, you know, this capacity is one that we associate with a much bigger newsroom than ours. We have, a, we have a small investigative unit, we have a small newsroom, but we're capable of doing uh, great things and important things. And, um, you know, we are training and, and developing this capacity for investigative journalism within our community. And that's the really important part. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, yep, thank you. And so I'm just going to share a couple of examples of stories uh, that we've been working on. You can view them at amsterdamnews.com slash blacklight. Um, but these are stories that um, our, our investigative unit and even reporters outside of our investigative unit have been working on. Uh, and they're stories that are important to us. We've, as part of our investigative unit, we've started an initiative called Beyond the Barrel of the Gun, which is uh, reporting on the root causes of uh, impact on and solutions to gun violence in black and brown communities. And again, the New York Times isn't doing that. The AP isn't doing that. ProPublica is doing it. The New York Amsterdam News, a 114-year-old black-owned newspaper is doing that. And I think that's a really powerful statement. Uh, next slide. And here's some other stories. The story on the left is <clears throat> by an, uh, one of our Report for America Corps members, an Asian American uh, young man, uh, recent Co Columbia Journalism School graduate, who did who brought me this uh, great idea for a story. Um, and him and uh, the story on the right, he and our other Report for America Corps member, Ariama C. Long. <clears throat> worked for on a couple of months for the, on this great story we published uh, on Juneteenth about the modern abolition movement, the abolition of, of prisons. And so one of the things I think it's really important to get across is that we're trying to redefine the idea of both who can do investigative journalism, but what investigative journalism looks like. Um, and I think for a long time, we felt excluded because we you know, investigative journalism was defined in a, in a very particular, I would say, relatively narrow way. But for us, it's it's really having the opportunity to dive deep on issues that um, our community cares about. Uh, next slide. And so <clears throat> one of the things that we're also doing as part of that, this is uh, from an article, a series of articles I did on the integration of the construction trades uh, that we published uh, last year. Uh, we're also looking at our own archives uh, and we're trying to make that connection between the past and the present. Uh, one of the nice things about being 114 years old is that we've covered the history of New York and the history of the United States over the past century. So being able to go in our archives and <clears throat> highlight the work that we have done as an institution on some of the issues that we're still covering that are still important in our community, I think is um, is something that's really important. Uh, next slide. And again, um, this is a story we did on, or I, I wrote on bail reform and the impact of bail reform. And again, that on the right here, you see um, that we were able to uh, dig into our archives and talk about what was going on in Rikers Islands, which is a place in New York City where a lot of people who are being held, who can't afford bail are being held. So being able to connect our past and our present is something that's really important for us. And 
it's an investigative technique uh, that we like to use. Next slide. Um, we're also using social media. If you follow, uh, if you search for New York Amsterdam News on Instagram or on <laughs> Twitter, you'll be able to see our social media posts, including some audiograms. Unfortunately, I can't play the audiogram because it's a PDF, but you can go on our uh, on our social media and find some audiograms we did for a recent uh, our recent story on bail reform, as well as a recent series uh, we did on uh, reparations um can you go to the next slide uh so that's the that's the end of my formal presentation but i just want to give you a little bit of <clears throat> background on us as an institution what we're trying to do but i really want to open the floor up uh to your questions uh so that hopefully you can uh learn what you want to learn rather than what i want to teach you I am going to jump in and take moderator's privilege because I'm intrigued by a couple of things. Um, the first one is I'm very curious about that conversation or how you prepare to go to publishers and the director of marketing and advertise, whatever it is that you had to go to to say mm -hmm. the New York Amsterdam News needs to have an investigative unit. Uh, what we're hearing from legacy media and other uh, platforms is that Profit pretty much is, is driving everything. And if, you know, you're not going to get the clicks, we're not going to deal with it. So tell us a little bit about how you were able to talk about this. That's a great question. So first of all, we are a for-profit organization. We're a family-owned community newspaper, but we're not a nonprofit. We're for-profit. So yeah, making, uh, making a profit. And even if you're a nonprofit, you want to at least break even. You don't want to be you know, losing millions of dollars a year, even as a nonprofit. And we've seen most recently the Center for Public Integrity um, laying people off because they had a multi-million dollar shortfall. Um, but I made a presentation. I had a vision. Uh, I created a multi-page presentation on how I thought that the investigative unit would work. And this is something that's really important. For a long time, we've been taught there has to be this firewall between money and the people who make the news. Well, I'm here to tell you that, unfortunately, journalists can no longer work in a vacuum where you don't think about money. Um, that's just the way it is. Now, that's not to say that money should be the only thing and the sole thing driving your decision-making editorial. It should, it should not. But I had to present kind of a business plan of here's how I think we can fund this. Here's how I think this will sustain itself as well as bring money into the newsroom. Um, and so I laid out a plan to do that and I found the funding for it. And uh, fortunately I had a really good and long relationship with my publisher. Uh, we've known each other for 30 years. So I was able to, she, you know, she's seen the work that I've done over the decades she knows that uh, I'm a fairly intelligent person and she read my proposal and it made sense to her. So, you know, it didn't take much convincing of in-house. It took a fair amount of convincing of funders. And, you know, the vast majority of the funding that supports our unit is philanthropic funding. Fortunately, I had a background in doing uh, grant writing uh, because that's as a freelance journalist for you know, 25 years. That's how I funded most of the work that I did is I wrote grants and wrote, you know, applied for fellowships. So I had an idea of how I could approach people. And we were fortunate enough to get some initial funding and then get some more funding and then get some more funding. But it's, you know, it's been a long process. And it, there was a lot of um, what we call donor education. First, introducing ourselves. Hey, this is who we are. You may have never heard of us. Here's why we're important. We've been around for a long time. We serve a very specific community that is underserved. And here are the things that we want to talk about. Here are the things that we are going to want to explore in our investigative unit. Uh, and it took some convincing. It's still taking convincing. You know, every, every day, every week, I've spent some of part of my day and some part of my week thinking about fundraising, thinking about money. 
Um, and, you know, I'd rather spend that time doing other things. But the reality is, is that because I'm doing it, I'm also in control of my destiny. There's not somebody else in my organization saying, oh, well, you know, we can raise money for something else. And, you know, investigative unit's not that important. The last part, uh, the last thing I'll say is that investigative units, A, they can bring in money uh, through sponsorships, through philanthropic funding, but they also drive engagement. Um, we're reaching new audiences because we're doing a type of work we've never done before. We're expanding our audience. We're getting more subscriptions. We're getting more clicks. So this idea that uh, investigative unit is the money that you a uh, hole that you throw money into is, I don't think it's accurate. Uh, I think in fact, it, it's an opportunity. There's money that we have raised both from individual donations, sometimes as small as, you know, $10 to six figure uh, grants from philanthropic organizations that we would not get but for the investigative unit. They're not interested in funding the rest of our newsroom. They're interested in funding specific projects or funding the investigative units. So for us, it's a huge ability to drive revenue as well as to increase engagement, uh, expand our audience, which also helps to drive revenue. See if there are any uh, questions from the fellows. Do I see any Zoom hands? Okay, there's uh, Mahar. Hi, thank you so much for talking to us today. It's been really interesting hearing from you. I guess this is more of like a thought, but also an open-ended question. Um, I'm an investigative reporter and, you know, just having worked in different newsrooms and two investigative teams over the past two, three years, I do realize it's a very difficult space to crack in journalism. Um, Can especially I jump in and ask you to uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Meher Sher. I'm um, an investigative reporter, a democracy reporter currently at Carolina Public Press, which is the only independent um, investigative outlet in North Carolina. Um, and yeah, so just going back to what I was talking about earlier, it is a difficult space to crack in terms of just growth um, and getting more opportunities to really lead and do the work, um, but also more so when you're looking at the international journalism space. Um, you know, I've for years applied to several opportunities where I felt a lot more prepared. I know certain languages. I've learned other languages to make myself more competitive. Um, and worked in those regions, but still found myself overlooked in the international journalism space for opportunities where usually white reporters are hired. Um, and I'm talking about places like Kabul and, you know, Eastern regions. How did you, how did you make that part of your career work for you? How did you manage to make those opportunities happen for you? And what can I do better or differently? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you. And congratulations to all of you for being part of this uh, wonderful opportunity. I think it's, um, I was just talking with my partner and saying that, you know, as will happen to you when you get older, you know, I wish some of these opportunities existed for me and my career would be different. Uh, so you're as difficult as the landscape is right now, you are actually blessed because uh, the vast majority of the opportunities, the wonderful opportunities that are available to you were not available to Rachel or myself. Um, and we, we feel that acutely. But to answer your question specifically, I think there are two things. One, when it comes to grants and fellowships, and I, I'm guessing that maybe you're referring to having applied for some of those, is that an accurate assessment? Or are you talking more into applying for jobs? Not so much the grants or fellowships. I mean, I'm currently employed. I covered the whole state, but um, I'm, I'm talking about more opportunities to work internationally. Okay. Um, and I mean, in terms of grants and fellowships, I've been successful at getting those. I think I've had a lot of support yeah. for international projects from like the Pulitzer Center, for instance, but yeah. for actual formal employed opportunities, right. it's really hard to pitch yourself as a correspondent or as a reporter yep. abroad yep. or a reporter of color. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing is, you know, as, as I think you already know, uh, grants and fellowships can help you do some of that work overseas, but often they're short term, right? Um, the truth is, is that those jobs are rare now. They're a lot rarer than when I started 
20, 25 years ago. They, they're, you know, most major newspapers in the U.S. have closed their their international bureaus. So you have fewer, you have the same or more people competing for fewer jobs. Um, so there are a couple things I think that are really important. One is network, network, network. That's why part of why you're here. Um, people tend to hire people they know and people that they like. So if you're not going to your uh, affinity conference, whether it be Asian American journalists or SPJ or IRE, go to those conferences, find a way. If you have to pay your own way, pay your own way. A lot of them have scholarships because getting in the room with people, getting to know people, pitching your own panels for some of these conferences, getting up on the dais, that raises your profile. Really important thing. The second thing, and this is not going to be something I think a lot of people want to hear, but worked for me. So I'm going to share my experience. It's not advice for everyone is go, go to the place that you want to be. So let's rewind to the year 2001. Hopefully everybody in this room, virtual room was born by the year 2001. I sure hope so. I don't want to feel that old. Um, I wanted to be an international correspondent. Um, I had been to Rwanda. I had uh, been a couple of other places. I felt like this was my destiny. Um, I knew that if I wanted to be an international staff correspondent, the way to do that was to go work at a small town newspaper for a couple of years, then work at a medium sized newspaper for a couple of years, then get recruited, hopefully by a national newspaper and work, you know, at a national newspaper, for maybe a decade. And then maybe I would get an opportunity to work on an international desk being 21 years old at the time i decided that i didn't want to wait 20 years for my shot and i bought a one-way ticket to indonesia i had uh 400 in my pocket and i had exactly one name and email address i ended up being there for 18 months i made it work i figured it out um, now, obviously, I would never do that again. <laughs> that was not a plan so much as an idea. Uh, I'm older. I'm wiser. I survived my own youthful folly. But going places, being there is the fastest way, and art, some would argue the best way, to get picked up. You start stringing for people. You call everybody in your Rolodex, you cold call people, you say, hey, look, I'm here. You need a reporter from here? I'm here. I'm ready. I speak English. I was trained at, you know, I went to blah, blah, blah college. I worked for blah, blah, blah in the States. I'm an American. I speak your language. And you go. Um, that's not for everybody. That's not comfortable for everybody. But if that's really what you want to do, save those pennies, develop a plan, go. Uh, being the, you know, there's a difference between asking someone to send you someplace and already being there. It reduces the friction. Uh, again, not for everybody, right? A lot of people want the stability of a paycheck every two weeks, the medical insurance, you know, a bureau chief looking out for you. And I, I would love that too, but I am who I am. <laughs> you are who you are. And it's harder to, to crack that door open. So I'm not saying that that what you want to do is impossible because it's definitely not. But I think if you're looking for that staff route, then you're really going to have to start working those networks because the vast majority of people who get hired, especially for these sort of high level positions, they're not looking through what comes in, you know, oh, send your email to jobs at newyorktimes.com. You ain't getting hired that way. You're getting hired because someone you know works there or someone you know knows somebody who works there and is going to walk you through the door. And nobody ever told me that. It took me probably until about seven years ago to figure this little piece of information out. But you're not going to get a job by applying for a job randomly. You're going to get a job because you connect to somebody on LinkedIn or you did a fellowship with somebody or you did a fellowship with somebody who works with somebody who's the hiring manager. If you don't know who the hiring manager is for the job that you're applying for, you ain't getting that job nine times, 99 times out of a hundred. That's hard one experience on my part. I didn't want to believe that. I didn't think that was true. That is 100% true uh, for most people, most of the time, especially at these very elite institutions. So 
work your network and or you want to report from Cairo, you want to report from, you know, Venezuela, go there, set up shop. And if your work is good and you work your network and you, you know, do the hard work, I, I, I believe you, you would be, you'd be picked up by people. I just want to thank you, Damasa, for making me feel utterly cruel magnan because I was 40 in 2001. So I'll get you for that. Uh, <laughs> I Keisha, will. You will. Um, Keisha, introduce yourself. You're next. Hey, I'm Keisha. I'm a producer at PBS NewsHour. Uh, so my question I, is... Hi, I just stole one of your colleagues there. Aaron Foley. Yes, you did. I was going to talk to you, Aaron. Yeah, I never worked mm -hmm. with him. But, like, he's great. I love Jimmy. Yeah. yeah. Um, but my question is, um, whenever I talk to seasoned investigative reporters about how they got their start doing this kind of work, they say similar things. They always say that in their first few newsrooms, they were never given the time or the space to do this kind of work, even if they had solid investigative ideas. So my question is, how do you find that balance of like doing the daily weekly grind that you have to do, turning up those stories that you know you have to do while also fully working on investigative things on the side. I've been having a hard time like finding that balance. Yeah. So um, I think it's different for different people. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think <clears throat> one approach is literally like blocking time off from your calendar just being like, okay, like being your own assignment editor, being your own, being like, okay, I'm going to work on this project. I'm going to give myself 12 weeks, pre-reporting, reporting, you know, writing, producing, whatever, fill in the blank. Like you have to, like, no one's going to want your success more than you, or no one should want your success more than you. So the reality is, is that you have to make the space for yourself. You have to be, you have to be undeniable. So regularly, you know, when I freelance for the Amsterdam News back in the day, I would go to my editor and be like, look, I want to do a multi-part series on cancer survivors of color. And they'd sort of look at me like I had three heads and be like, whatever, okay. Now, if I waited for my editor to hold my hand and be like, how's that going? And do No, I went out and did it in addition to doing the, you know, five stories a week that I had to do as a freelancer to put, you know, to pay my rent. It's, it's very similar to what you're already doing. It's just adding another, you know, if you're juggling three balls, now you're juggling four, which I juggle, you know, I can literally juggle three balls. I can't juggle four because it's, it's literally like an order of magnitude harder to juggle four balls than three. But if you can learn that skill, you have a superpower all of a sudden. So that's one option. Another option is apply for a grant or a fellowship, you know, in theory with your, your supervisor's permission, then that gives you some structure and hopefully yeah. some money to be able to say, okay, you have to do things. Um, for me as a freelancer, the hardest part of, of balancing things was motivating myself to be like, okay, this is not something I have to do. This is something I want to do. This is something that's important to me. And literally creating the space for the thing that I wanted to do, not just the thing I had to do. It ultimately it comes down to some, some kind of self-motivation, some kind of Jedi mind trick that you play on yourself to be like, okay, like I'm just going to pretend like this is the fifth story I have to do this week. And I'm going to allocate, you know, X amount of time to doing it. It's not easy. That's why the vast majority of the people who you work with don't do it. But if you can do it, if you can be undeniable, if you can be like, look, I've already done the pre-reporting. I've already lined up the interviews. Like, this is a real story, boss. Make it really hard for them to say no to you. Mm -hmm. And then if they still won't let you do the work that you want to do, go somewhere else. Yeah. I've had a lot of success recruiting people. Uh, and I'm not going to name any names, but I've had success recruiting people because I've told them, look, we ain't going to make you rich. We're probably not going to make you famous, but you're going to get to do the journalism you want to do. And for people who have been in this business for a minute, they realize how rare and how important that is. And for me, like, I ain't rich. I ain't famous. You know, I've been rejected by every name institution more times than I can count. But guess what? 
I get to do the work. I've gotten to do the work throughout my career and I continue to get to do the work that matters to me. And at the end of the day, what did I spend my time doing? Was it something somebody else wanted me to do? Or was it something I wanted to do? That's a choice that we all have to make in our lives and in, in our careers. And the other thing is, is look, at a certain point, I realized, look, you know, I, lo- I love being a journalist, but I have something I have something I can give back. Maybe I should become an editor. Well, when I came back to the States in, in 2016, I applied for maybe 50 jo- editor jobs in journalism. I didn't get a single one. I thought I was done with journalism, to be quite honest. I created my own space at the Amsterdam News so that I could give other people opportunities. Now, I never wanted to be a boss. I never wanted to be an administrator. It's the last thing. That's, my personality is not suited for it. And yet here I am, right? Because I realized it was incredibly important for me. You know, I didn't create the investigative unit so I could do investigative work. I created the investigative unit so that other people could do that work because I never had that opportunity. Uh, in the way that I've created it here. So create, you know, if they won't give it to you where you're at, create your own space somewhere or find or go somewhere where they're willing to give you that space or create a space for yourself and other people. Uh, There's a lot of opportunity out there, but all that suffices to say is that it's hard. It's challenging. It's, it's the road not taken for a reason. It's full of rocks and thorny weeds. Yeah. Well, thank you so so much. Thank you. You're starting to scare me, Damaso, because I came back to the U.S. in 2016. I applied for every job in the book. I was rejected by everybody I applied to, and I thought it was over. Well, it was a nice ride when I had it. Yep. Uh, Lily, introduce yourself. Hello. My name is Lily Smith. Um, I'm a photojournalist at the Des Moines Register. Um, I had a different question, but something you just said uh, kind of piqued my interest. So I, I'm going to I'm going to change my question. Um, Go ahead. You, were, you were just talking about how you feel like your your personality isn't suited to be like people's manager. Can you um, kind of expand on that thought a little bit? Uh, I'm in a <clears throat> I'm like getting a master's degree in journalism leadership right now. And my first class had me thinking about like that exact phrase for the last like six weeks that like maybe maybe this is or is not uh, actually suited for me to be like somebody else's editor. Um, yeah. But I'm very I'm very interested in your thoughts um, based on like what you just said. Yeah, um, it's it's a big area of personal growth for me. So uh, when my one of my bosses came to me, you know, maybe a year or two ago and said, you know, you should be executive editor. I said, hell no. I got the job I want. And I don't even want this job being investigative editor, but you know, I, I can deal with that job. I don't want to be everybody's boss. That's not me. I've never, I, I don't want to be a center of attention. I don't want to be in charge of people. I don't want to hold other people responsible. There was a need. And I, I was, a, you know, looking around, I was the only one who could, who could fill it. Unfortunately, if there had been somebody else, I would have pointed at them and been like, pick them, pick them. The other thing that I, I realized is that I want to give people, I want to be the manager that I always wanted, right? I want to give people opportunity. I want to support people. And that means that I need to grow. That means I need to do things that I'm not comfortable with. But the, and it's not something I expected, but the most fulfilling thing that I think I've ever experienced journalistically is helping somebody else realize their story, helping someone else walk through and be like, no, look, it's right there just move this over here and, and and think about this. And it's like, and then you see a piece of great journalism and I didn't have to write it. I didn't have to go out and photograph it, but I helped somebody else do it. It's been incredibly fulfilling for me and I never expected it. But um, the important thing for me, is, or the poor, I think, you know, I, did, I didn't expect or want to grow as a person. <laughs> I thought I was doing all right. Like, yeah, I'm a little prickly, whatever. I do my journalism. I mostly work alone. I'm happy doing things the way I'm doing it. But there's an opportunity to help other people. And that's ultimately what being a manager, it, it be, I think being an editor as well, it's being of service. And, you know, it's one thing to look out in the world and be like, you know, that's messed up. 
there's there's no black investigative people out there. There's no there's not even a single investigative unit of legacy black newspaper. Man, that's you know, I'm gonna write an op-ed about that. I hope somebody figures that out. I hope somebody solves that problem. Well, guess what? I need to solve that problem, at least within the capacity I'm able to. Um, so I stepped up and it hasn't been easy. It hasn't always been fun, but it's been meaningful. And so as journalists, you know, sometimes we have to, and as humans, I think we, you know, sometimes the world cries out for help, right? And, and what are we going to do? Are we going to ignore the problem? Are we going to identify the problem and hope somebody else solves it? Or are we going to try to be part of the solution? Now, not everyone needs to be, not everyone in this call needs to be or, or should be a, a newsroom leader or, or is temperamentally suited for it. But there are more newsroom leaders on this call than you think there are. I never expected to be a newsroom leader, and here I am. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm perfect. Doesn't mean I'm great. Doesn't mean that I don't have a I don't have a lot of insecurity or I don't have a lot of growth to do. All those things are true, and yet I can still be a leader. I hope that partially answers your your question. Let's go to uh, Brianna. Hey, I'm Brianna. Um, I am a newly a uh, criminal justice reporter at Michigan Public. Used to be Michigan Radio, but um. I think something that really piqued my interest as soon as you started talking was this idea of what like investigative journalism is supposed to be like, you know, it's all the president's men. It's like spotlight. It's these big year long things. And um, I'm not on an enterprise team and I have done one data story and I'm like, I really didn't come to journalism to do math, but I do think I can do like deeper dive. So I guess I just am asking you to talk a little bit more about like the expansiveness of investigative journalism and how you talk about that with your team, that it doesn't have to be like always these huge like follow the you know data type of stories there's like other investigations right so one of the things that it, it's funny i was having a conversation with some of my colleagues and you know where they were like well you know can we do this and i like got really quiet and i said we can do whatever the hell we want to we're in charge um investigative work can be whatever you want it to be and no one else is going to tell you that. Maybe I'll tell you that. And you can say, well, Damaso said that investigative journalism can be whatever I want. Go, go, go be mad at him. And it can be. It can be short. It can be long form. It can take a couple of days. It can take a couple of years, right? It can be anything in between. We get to decide what it is. If it's meaningful, if it uncovers something new, it doesn't have to lead to the resignation of a political leader. It doesn't have to uncover billions of dollars of corruption. Does it uncover some new information? Does it put old information in new light? Does it help somebody? All those things are forms of investigative journalism. But here's the thing. When some crusty old editor tells you that's not investigative journalism, that's because they are trying to control your narrative. They're trying to limit you, right? And so you, again, you have to be undeniable. And at a certain point, this is something that's really important. And it, it sounds scary because it is scary. If you're not getting the opportunities at the place that you're at, find someplace else to be. Because it's not going to magically happen overnight. You're going to get to some point, you're going to realize these people will not let me do what I want to do. It's incumbent upon you to either force them to let you do what you want to do or to find someplace that will. Um, and listen, I'm, I'm recruiting people all day. If I had you know, another $5 million, I could snatch a lot of folks from a lot of high level places. Because my big pitch is like, I'm not going to tell you no. I'm hiring you because I know you and I like you and I like the work that you are doing and want to do. And I want to support that. And as long as you can make a credible case for your work, I'm never going to tell you no. You know, I wish I could make a ton of places like that. Uh, but right now I, I, I'm here and we're doing the work we're doing. But, you know, redefine it force them to acknowledge your vision is also part of this thing we call investigative journalism. Odyssey. Hi, Damaso. How are you? Um, thank you for doing this. I actually have a question on the grants and fellowships that you talked about. A lot of these grants expect you to have an, like a, a publication that will carry your story once you're 
done doing the reporting. So I just wanted to get some of your advice on how you, uh, you know, s- suggest going about that conversation mm-hmm. with your newsroom that may or not may not be interested in applying for that grant or, you know, teaming with you to apply for that grant. So, yeah. So this is a, this is a tough one and it goes back to, I think what I just said. Um, It's really important to um, have a place that supports you, right? Have a place that's like, okay, we want you to succeed. We're interested in doing the work that you're interested in doing. Um, That's, that's that's hard. Um, it, it's 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 not easy. I've been fortunate to have a place like the Amsterdam News um, that has essentially almost always said yes to all my ideas. Um, find a place like that, or find an editor like that. Really develop your relationships with your editors, whether they're um, where you're at, or. Um, where you, you know, another institution, if you're allowed to freelance, um, it's, there, there's no sort of magic bullet, except that to say that I think it's incredible, you know, in all of your relationships, whether it be personal or professional, it's very important to say what you want and what you need out of that relationship, right? Your editors should not be surprised that you want to do international work or you want to do investigative work. You should be talking with your manager and your manager's manager and tell them look this is what i want and if they say look you're doing you know you're doing something else and that's all you're ever going to do then you know where you stand and you can look for other opportunities elsewhere uh but developing a support structure where you know look right now in my newsroom we've got six people well more than that we've got 10 people and five of them are doing some kind of fellowship or grant and we've got a freelance person who's doing a fellowship that we're going to publish. I'm a huge supporter of professional development. I'm a huge supporter of grants and fellowships because that's how I did my entire career. So I'm out there like, you want to apply for that? Great. You know, let's talk about your pitch. I'm a super supportive person. I know that's not the case for a lot of the people you work with, but you have to convince them that it's in their interest. It's adding value to the newsroom as well as you should be working for people who want you to grow and to succeed. Uh, one of the things that I tell people in my newsroom is, look, in the in the in the in the rare case that you don't want to spend your entire career working at the Amsterdam News, then doing professional development, doing fellowships is going to help your career. I I, I I tell that to the people who work for me, not because I want them to leave, but because I want them to grow and I want them to have you know a thriving career, whether or not that's you know they spend the next thirty years working at our news organization or not. I think that's what editors should do. Um, But maybe that makes me strange. I don't know. I just shared in the chat a uh, a list of of grants and and fellowships that myself and my partner put together uh, in case anybody's interested in in looking at that. I think we can take one more question and then I'm going to jump in. Ambar. Hi, thanks for speaking to us. Um, I'm Ambad. I'm from another community media outlet in New York City to so represent. Um, and I think you also mentor one of my good friends, Jonathan Custodio. So it's good to finally yeah. meet you, even through Zoom. Yeah, so on the same note as Aditi's question, I was wondering if you could speak about any specific best practices you found for bu- for building buy-in for your investigative uh, passion projects from people who give you mm-hmm. grants. Um or yeah, or if there there's anything specific you do, and also like even before you were a leader in that way, building that buy-in from colleagues. Uh, do your homework. Step one. Um, when reporters come to me with pitches, when they come to me ideas that they want to present to is fellowship ideas. The 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 baseline I tell them is that. This proposal, this idea has to have more information than I can find in five minutes of Googling. If I can spend five minutes in Googling and learn more than I can learn from your your pitch, your proposal, the conversation we're going to have about the thing that you're supposedly so passionate about, I'm going to not take your proposal seriously. I'm not going to take you seriously, more importantly. 
Like you have to do the work. You have to know the thing even before you get the go ahead. You have to do your pre-reporting. And that's time. That's your own time you're spending, right? Doing that. That's free. That's free time that you're giving, but to the thing that you're passionate about. So again, be undeniable. Why is this important? Why is this relevant? Why do we have to do this? Why do you have to do this? Why do we have to publish this? Why is this relevant to our audience? Like you should know the answer to some level of answer to all, all of those questions. You may not have the, all the answers, right? That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for, again, you need to know more about the thing that you're passionate about than I can find out in five minutes uh, as, a, as a base level, right? And then you have to start, you have to build from there. Um, there are there, There's one project that I finally got a grant for that I had been thinking about and, and originally pitched 10 years before. And then I finally got somebody to fund it. Uh, not that I'm saying that all things should take that long, but you should develop that expertise, right? You shouldn't come into meetings unless it's with someone you deeply, deeply trust and you have a really good relationship. You shouldn't come with meetings being like, so, you know, I had this idea and I'm not really sure and I don't know. And Okay, I don't have time for that. I'm an editor. I've got 15 other things to do. Again, now if it's someone you have a deep relationship with and you can, you know, do this kind of work with, because that's what I do with my reporters, like, okay, great. But when a freelancer comes to me and they're like, you know, and I'm like, no, come back to me when you have something. I've got like, I've got a full plan. Um, so, and I think that's also true of funders, right? If you're applying for a fellowship, if you're applying for philanthropic funding, funders want, they want to, they want to know, I'm about to give you a big pile of money. Are you going to be able to execute? Because look, I know I can give it to ProPublica, the New York Times, and blah, 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 and they're probably going to win an award. Why should I give it to Miss Castillo? I've never heard of her. Nobody I know knows her. She's an unknown quantity. So how do you counteract that? Well, networking, but B, be undeniable. You have your proposal buttoned up. I've, you know, I'm on, uh, occasionally I'm on the, the jury of uh, fellowships. And when I come across a fellowship that just happens to be in some area of expertise that I, that I have, and I know more than the person who's applying for the thing, I'm like, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to vote you down because you clearly don't know what you're talking about. You have to know what you're talking about. That is, I mean, I think that's just good life advice, but I think that's essential for getting someone to do something that they might not want to do for you. Um, so be undeniable. For my last question, and I think the last question of the session, we are in such a time now when equity and justice and diversity and all of these words that mean so much to people of color when it comes to achieving and, and trying to achieve some of these goals are under question, are denied, are dismissed, or whatever. So what message do you have for these journalists when it comes to this issue of wanting to produce the type of content that the Amsterdam News produces in an atmosphere where it's it may not be received as well as it could be? Yeah, it's um, if it's right and, and just, then keep fighting for it. Um, one of the things that w I think works in general is persistence, right? Um, if somebody tells you no, then ask again, ask a different way, address their concerns. But here's the bottom line. A lot of the institutions you work at were not built for you. That's just, that's just honesty. They weren't built for you. They weren't designed with... Amber or Brianna or Sarah or Lily in mind when they were built. So you can change those institutions, right? And sometimes that means doing things we're not comfortable, being becoming a leader, pushing, causing disruption, making other people uncomfortable. Sometimes it means going elsewhere. Sometimes it means going to institutions that were built for you, like the Amsterdam News, or building your own institutions. We're in the great first golden days of nonprofit journalism. They're always popping up. And God bless them, I say. 
more the merrier. But don't forget about places like the Amsterdam News. We've been around for 114 years, given opportunities to black and brown journalists, reporting on stories when nobody else would. Uh, there are lots of newspapers like us in, in, you know, in Spanish language and other languages, serving different communities, community media. Um, you know, like most journalists, I used to have this dream of, oh, I work for the New York Times one day. I'm going to win a Pulitzer Prize. For... New York Times doesn't want me. They've made that abundantly clear over the decades. That's okay, because I wouldn't get to do the work that I'm doing now at the New York Times, more likely than that. Not that there aren't good people at the New York Times. There are. There are great people at AP. Ron Nixon, the investigative editor, make him your best friend. He's an amazing fellow, right? He's changing that institution. But he had to go from being a reporter to now being, you know, he has some crazy title at the Associated Press. He sacrificed it to open the door for the rest of us. So what are you willing to sacrifice to see your dream come true or make, your, make the dream that you wanted available to somebody else? It's not easy. Uh, there are a lot easier ways to make money. There are a lot easier ways to to be happy than to be a journalist. But we, I think everybody on this call is doing it because they care about journalism. They care about the communities they come from or the communities they serve. Um, and so we just have to keep fighting. And you can fight from the inside. You can fight from the outside. Uh, you can create your own institutions. That's possible. Look, Talk to me 10 years ago, I would have never said, A, I want to be executive editor, or B, I want to create an investigative unit. I had no interest in doing any of those things. And yet here I am somehow doing it. And it's fulfilling. So, you know, you're at the beginning stages of your career. Uh, keep yourselves open to what may come down the road. Someone may point to you and say, are you willing to step up? And then when you find yourselves in this position, remember this conversation, remember this call, because once you're in those positions of power, no matter how little power you have, what are you doing to make it easier for someone else? What are you doing to change the place that you're at for the better? That's the question you should be asking yourself every day when you wake up, uh, because that's the only way we're going to see the kinds of changes. And we have people now in some of these institutions who are doing some of that work which is amazing. We need more. They need more help. They need allies. Uh, and we also need other institutions uh, to put pressure on those institutions so that it's not like, oh, well, if you want to read investigative reporting about the Black community, then you have to go to the New York Times or uh, ProPublica. Well, now you can go to the Amsterdam News. You know, we're putting pressure on the marketplace. So I really appreciate all the hard work that all of you are doing and all the challenges that, that you're facing and feel free to reach out to me anytime my emails and chat. And I look forward to seeing your future success because this is what makes me happy these days. Thank you. Listen, if I didn't already have a terrific job, I would want to come work for you. So at this point, I would like to thank you so much to Maso Reyes, the executive editor and the investigations editor at the New York Amsterdam News. And I'd like our fellows to show their appreciation in the Zoom. Give, up, give it up on the Zoom hands. Thank you all for all the side. hard work that you're doing. And thank you very much, Rachel, for the for the invitation and the hard work that you're doing, the opportunity you're giving these uh, wonderful young journalists. Well, we all will be in touch more than likely. But once again, thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.